Hello and welcome to this A-Level Chemistry multiple choice question walkthrough focusing on the bonding, shapes and polarity topic. Feel free to download the questions from the description, then have a go at them and watch this video to see how you got on. Which molecule is not able to form a coordinate bond with another species? A coordinate bond, or dative covalent bond, is a covalent bond formed when one atom provides both of the shared electrons. And so, in order for a molecule to be able to become involved in a coordinate bond, it either needs to be able to donate that lone pair of electrons into the coordinate bond, or receive the lone pair of electrons into the coordinate bond. And so in BH3, you will have a boron atom with three electron pairs around it. And because boron is in group three, there won't be a lone pair. And so boron will be able to receive the lone pair in a coordinate bond. Whereas in B, the carbon atom is in group four, it's bonded to four hydrogen atoms, so it will have eight electrons around it in four pairs. So there are no lone pairs, and there are no spaces for lone pairs to be donated into. So this will not be able to form a coordinate bond, and so B is the correct answer. If we moved on just to check the others, nitrogen in the ammonia has got a lone pair, so it can donate a pair of electrons into a coordinate bond, and water, the oxygen atom in water, has actually got two lone pairs of electrons, which it could potentially use to form a coordinate bond by donating. So B is the correct answer, because it can't form the coordinate bond. Which species has a square planar shape from the options that we're being shown here? In order for a molecule to have a square planar shape, we actually need six pairs of electrons around the central atom. Two of these electron pairs will be lone pairs of electrons in the axial position above and below the central atom. The other four pairs will be in the square planar arrangement and they will be the bonding pairs of electrons. So what we're looking for here really is six pairs of electrons, two of which being lone pairs, four being bonding pairs. To work out what the shape is, we need to consider the central element and what group it's in, because that's the number of valence electrons. Then we consider the coordination number, in other words, how many elements are bonded to it. Then we account for some charge, and then we get the total number of electrons. And so for A, nitrogen has five valence electrons, it's bonded to four hydrogen, it's got a positive charge, which means it's lost an electron, which means in total there will be eight electrons in four pairs. Definitely not square planar, that will be tetrahedral in fact. Sulfur is in group six, which means six valence electrons. Add that to the four from the four fluorines, gives us a total of 10, divided by two gives us five electron pairs. Again, that will not be square planar. Xenon tetrafluoride in C. Xenon is in group zero, or eight, so it's got eight valence electrons. Add that to the four from the fluorine gets us 12, divide that by two gets us six. We've only got four bonding pairs between the xenon and the fluorine, so this will be our square planar shape and the correct answer. You'd move on in a test here, but just to double check D, phosphorus is in group five, there are four chlorines attached, take away one electron because it's positive, gives us eight electrons, four pairs, tetrahedral shape. Which substance exists as a macromolecule? Well, a macromolecule, sometimes known as a giant covalent structure, is something that you get when non-metals bond together in a huge repeating lattice pattern. And so first of all, we're looking for something that is only comprised of non-metals. So copper in A will be a giant metallic lattice, so that's the wrong answer. Silicon dioxide is only composed of non-metals, so that's a possibility, and this is the correct answer. Silicon dioxide forms a giant covalent structure, or a macromolecule, in a not too dissimilar way to diamond. P4O10 is a simple molecule. It's composed of non-metals, so it's covalent, and there's a finite number of elements in that formula, so it's a simple molecule. MgO is comprised of a metal bonded to a non-metal, so a giant ionic lattice. Here we're being asked 
Which bond has the most unsymmetrical electron distribution? That's a fancy way of saying which of these bonds has the greatest dipole. Dipoles are caused when you have two atoms that are sharing a pair of electrons that have got a different electronegativity. And the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the bigger the dipole, the bigger the unsymmetrical electron distribution. Now, since these bonds all involve hydrogen as one of the two atoms, what we're really looking for is which of the other elements has the greatest electronegativity to give it the biggest difference between hydrogen. There are two rules that we need to know about electronegativity. First of all, elements get more electronegative the higher up they are in their group. And so we've got oxygen which is in period two, sulfur is in period three, nitrogen is in period two, and phosphorus is in period three. So we can rule out the sulfur and the phosphorus because they're going to have lower electronegativities than oxygen and nitrogen. They're going to be closer to hydrogen. The oxygen and nitrogen, we tell them apart because electronegativity increases across a period, which means that oxygen will have a greater electronegativity than nitrogen, and so it will have the biggest difference when you compare it to hydrogen. So A is the correct answer. Which of these compounds has hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen bonding is the strongest of the three different types of intermolecular force, and there are two important criteria for deciding whether or not a substance will have hydrogen bonding. The way I remember it is writing hydrogen bonding in a slightly silly way. You can see the way I've written the hydrogen part, I've built in that delta plus inside the word hydrogen. So that's one of the two criteria that you need to have. So you need an electron deficient hydrogen atom. So if we look at our four examples, you can see that NaH, the hydrogen will actually be the hydride ion. So no electron deficient hydrogen, so that's a no. In B, the hydrogen is attached to the nitrogen. Nitrogen is a highly electronegative atom, and so that will mean that the hydrogen will be electron deficient. In HI, again, iodine is quite electronegative, so the hydrogen will be electron deficient. And then in SiH4, silicon is not particularly electronegative. There won't be much of a polar bond in that substance, so that's a no. The second criteria for hydrogen bonding, you can see I've written the word bonding in a very silly way. We've got the F instead of the B. That's because in order to get hydrogen bonding, you need to have, in addition to the delta positive hydrogen, an atom of fluorine or oxygen or nitrogen with the lone pairs that each of these elements has. And that's because these are particularly electronegative elements. And so if we look down our four options, Na, definitely not very electronegative. It's in fact quite the opposite. And in B, we've got NH3. So that's a second tick for NH3. So that means that it must be the correct answer. If we carry on looking at C, we've got iodine, which is quite electronegative, but not as much as fluorine, oxygen or nitrogen. And SiH4 definitely doesn't have those three either. And so B is the correct answer. Which is the correct crystal structure for the substance named? Well, there are four crystal structures that we need to know about. There is the giant metallic lattice, which is obviously what you see in metals such as magnesium. There's the giant ionic lattice, which is when a non-metal joins with a metal and you get positive and negative ions. And then there is the giant covalent structure or macromolecular that you get with diamond and graphite, the allotropes of carbon and silicon and silicon dioxide. And then we've got the simple molecular substances, which is what you get when you have small molecules joined together through intermolecular forces. And so the correct answer here is A, because iodine is I2, a diatomic molecule, and that will be simple molecular. Diamond is giant covalent, sodium chloride will be ionic, and graphite also giant covalent. So the correct answer is A. Which of these atoms has the highest electronegativity? Electronegativity is the power of an atom to pull the bonding pair of electrons towards itself in a covalent bond. And there are two patterns you need to know about for electronegativity. One is that it increases as you go up a group. 
And the other pattern, which is the one that we need here, is that it increases across a period. And the reason for that is that the nuclear charge increases whilst the shielding stays the same. We have to disregard the noble gases because typically the noble gases have a low electronegativity because they don't readily form covalent bonds because they are already stable. So as we work our way towards the right, we hit sodium first, so that's a no. Then magnesium is next. That's also going to be not the highest electronegativity. And so the last one that we reach before the noble gases is chlorine. And so that is the correct answer. Which of these species has a trigonal planar structure? Well, the trigonal planar structure is where we have got three pairs of electrons that are all bonding pairs of electrons, and they are 120 degrees apart from each other around the central atom. And so what that means is we're looking for the species that has got six electrons in its valence shell and no lone pairs. The way that we're going to do this is we're going to consider what group the central atom is in. That's the number of valence electrons it's got. We're going to consider how many bonds it must have to other atoms, which is the coordination number. And then we're going to account for any charge. This will allow us to get the total number of electrons, and then we could divide it by two to get the total number of electron pairs. And we're looking for the one that the answer is going to be six electrons and therefore three bonding pairs. And so if we look at the first one, phosphorus is in group five, so five valence electrons. There are three hydrogen atoms attached. That's going to give us a total of eight electrons, three being bonding pairs, one going to be a lone pair. This will be trigonal pyramidal. So wrong, because it's not trigonal planar. BCl3, boron is in group three, so three valence electrons. It's bonded to three chlorine atoms. So that's going to give us a total of six electrons. There are three bonds between boron and chlorine, which means there will be three bonding pairs. Therefore, B is the correct answer. It will be trigonal planar. Just to explore the last two, H3O+, plus, that's called the hydroxonium ion. Oxygen is in group six. There are three hydrogens attached, that takes us to nine. It's overall positively charged, which means an electron has been lost. That means we've got eight electrons, four pairs, three of them will be bonding pairs and one lone pair. So that will be trigonal pyramidal again. And last of all, D, C is in group four. There's three hydrogens attached. There's an extra electron because it's negatively charged. Again, this takes us to eight. So again, trigonal pyramid. So B is the correct answer. Which substance has delocalized electrons? Substances that have delocalized electrons can conduct electricity because the electrons can move through the structure and carry the charge with it as they go. There are two substances that you need to know about that can conduct electricity. The first is metals, and again, the delocalized electrons can move in amongst the metal ions, and the other one is graphite. And in graphite, each carbon atom in the structure has only got three covalent bonds. Carbon has got four valence electrons. So that fourth electron that is not involved in forming a covalent bond is delocalized and free to move through the structure. And so the correct answer here is A. Iodine is simple molecular, so there are no charged particles at all. Sodium chloride is ionic, so it's got positive and negative ions, but not delocalized electrons. And tetrachloromethane is going to be simple molecular again. Which compound has the highest boiling point? The one that has the highest boiling point is the one that's going to have the strongest forces between their molecules and therefore require the most energy to separate. So really we're looking for which one of these has got the strongest intermolecular forces. There are three types of intermolecular force. There are van der Waals forces, which are found in everything. The second strongest intermolecular force is permanent dipole-dipole attractions. And that's caused when you've got an electronegativity difference somewhere within the molecule, which is the dipole region. And then there is hydrogen bonding, which is the strongest type of intermolecular force. So really we're on the lookout for whether or not this has got hydrogen bonding. And the way to work this out is we need to look for the electron deficient hydrogen or the delta plus hydrogen. And we need a fluorine, oxygen or nitrogen atom because they are highly electronegative and have a lone pair. 
And so if we take each of these in turn, this is one bromopropane. There will definitely be a dipole in this molecule because bromine is more electronegative than carbon, but there won't be hydrogen bonding. So this is unlikely to be number one. In B, this is one fluoropropane. So again, this is going to have a dipole, definitely. It's got the fluorine, so it might have hydrogen bonding, but none of those hydrogen atoms are electron deficient, so it will only have permanent dipole-dipole forces. The next one is propanal, which has got the electronegative oxygen atom, but no electron deficient hydrogen, so it will not have hydrogen bonding either. And then last of all, we've got propanoic acid, which has got two electronegative oxygen atoms, and it's got the electron deficient hydrogen atom. So this will have hydrogen bonding, and so that is the strongest intermolecular force only present in this one molecule, and so this molecule will have the highest boiling point as a result, and so D is the correct answer. Which row shows the bonding in ammonium chloride? Well, there's a few ways to start this. I'm going to start it by looking at the chloride. Chloride comes from chlorine, and chlorine gains an electron and becomes a chloride ion. And so that means that we've got some ionic bonding in this structure. So that rules out A and B, which have got ionic crossed out. Ammonium is the positive ion that is attracted to the chloride ion electrostatically. And the ammonium ion is a molecular ion that comes from ammonia. Ammonia is NH3, where nitrogen is covalently bonded to three hydrogen atoms. So there's going to be covalent bonding in this structure. What happens to make the ammonium ion is ammonia uses its lone pair of electrons to accept a proton to make the NH4+. That's a dative covalent bond. So the correct answer is C. We have all three types of bonding. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.